you loved our seven tips to be a faster, safer rider. So we're back with seven more tips to be a faster, safer rider. Hi, I'm Dave with Canyon Chasers. Riders can be fast and safe. The two are not mutually exclusive. So here are seven more tips on being a better rider. And by better, we mean not falling down. Because when it comes to street riding, getting there first is optional, but getting there in one piece is mandatory. You've been riding for a few years, maybe even done a few track days. Maybe you've been riding for 20 years or more. You've got this, or do you? It's not uncommon for experienced riders to say they don't need to take a course or they don't think they would benefit from some track time because they have 20 years of experience. Yet I see them ride and I wonder how on earth they have survived this long. I wonder, does this rider have 20 years of experience or one year of experience repeated 20 times? Rust never sleeps. Entropy is real and we see it in every facet of our lives. You reach your goal weight, but if you don't stay on top of it, you start putting the weight right back on. You only live in that Im impeccable shape for maybe 24 hours. The, it's like, a, it's like an orchid right? that, <laughs> that blooms and dies on the same day, you know? It's like care and concern, watering and the perfect amount of sunshine for six months and then it just, mm -hmm. and you take a selfie. <laughs> The exact same thing happens with our riding. If we wish to be the best riders we can be, we would be well advised to constantly be working on improving our riding. There isn't a day I go out on the bike when I don't decide before I even leave the driveway what skill I plan on working on today. Should I focus on keeping my head and eyes up? Should I work on being smooth and progressive with my brakes? Should I emphasize delaying and defining my apexes? This is even more important to keep in mind when we've spent any time off the bike, even if you've only been off the bike for a few wintry months. Your riding skills have suffered, not to mention that car drivers have grown accustomed to not seeing motorcycles. To be the best riders we can, we must remain vigilant. Going fast on a motorcycle is the simplest thing. It's not hard to twist a throttle. And as a community, we're good at turning on the go fast. But despite how much horsepower our bikes produce, the brakes are the most powerful tool you have at your fingertips. If we want to become fast and safe, then the goal is to become a master breaker. The vast majority of the people leaving comments on our videos are great. Our little community is super cool, especially compared to a lot of you know, other YouTube comment sections. But in reading through those comments, especially the comments on our trail braking video, the most misunderstood component is our brakes, particularly the front brake. A lot of the thinking is that because the rear tire is bigger, it has a bigger contact patch and therefore provides more grip. Physics tells us this is not the case. So if you think back to high school, you may have been taught at Montan's laws. The force of friction is directly proportional to the applied load and the force of friction is independent of the apparent area of contact. But what does this mean? Well, in simplest terms, science says weight determines how much grip we have more than the size of the contact patch. So here's part two. What happens on any vehicle when we slow down? Well, weight shifts to the front. A lot of the braking related crashes we've seen have come from riders getting scared or grabbing or stabbing at the brakes. Without any weight over the front tire, it is likely to lose traction. And this is why so many of us are shy about the front brake. A saying you hear often in the racing world is wait for the weight, and it works everywhere. If you're doing an emergency stop or trail braking into a decreasing radius downhill corner, we need to wait for the weight to shift onto the front tire so that there is adequate friction to keep the tire stuck to the road. As that weight shifts onto the front tire, it also deforms the tire and the contact patch gets even bigger as opposed to what's happening to the rear tire. More weight shifts away from the rear tire and the contact patch gets smaller. 
So as you go out on your next ride, keep this phrase rattling around in your head. When it's time to slow down, wait for the weight. Squeeze that brake lever slowly and progressively. Wait for the weight to shift onto that front tire. Do as one very wise seven-year-old rider once said to me, don't surprise the tire. One Christmas, uh, when I was a kid, I was watching my mom prepare the Christmas ham. And before putting it into the oven, she cut off both ends, which seemed kind of odd to me. So I asked why. And she said, well, she'd always done it that way because it's the way her mom did it. I continued, but why? My mom didn't have an answer. So later that night, she called grandma, her mother, and asked, the reason why grandma cut the ends off the ham? The only pan she had at the time was too small. So the only way to get the ham to fit into the pan, cut off the ends. We need to be inquisitive and adaptable. Just because that's the way it's always been done doesn't mean it's the best way to do things. In fact, motorcycling has seen a dramatic shift with data logging, which has led to a much more complete understanding as to how a motorcycle works the way it does. A lot of programs and a lot of well-intentioned riders coach based on how they ride, which may not be the best way to ride. Think of all the really awful advice you may have heard over the years. Never use the rear brake, you'll high side. Never use the front brake, you'll flip over the handlebars. If things get scary, layer down to avoid a crash. So for us, this means if we want to become the best riders, we need to be skeptical. Perusing the internets, we read all manner of crazy advice, and some of it sounds really convincing. But when put under more intense scrutiny, a lot of it simply doesn't hold up. Verify everything, which honestly is why we always try to attribute and provide sources in the descriptions of our videos. Motorcycles and jazz have a lot in common. If you like jazz, I'm sorry, but I dare you to disagree with what I'm about to say. As a matter of fact, if you do like jazz, I'm willing to bet you like it for a lot of the same reasons you love motorcycles. All right, so where am I going with this? Jazz is unpredictable. You think you know the melody, the pace, the rhythm, the beat. You're singing along to the chorus, and just when you think you got it, bam, it completely changes. Jazz is stupid. I mean, just play the right notes. How different is a good motorcycle road? It's tipping to the left and to the right. The asphalt is smooth and flowy. You're getting into the groove. You're feeling it. Oh. I can get used to that. And then, as you tip into a sweeping left hand bend, bam, a downhill button hook to the right. True story. A buddy of mine on a mellow sweeping road charged into a sorta of blind off camber or fall away corner, panicked, stabbed the brakes and totally augured in. His response, stupid road, it wasn't a stupid road. You can't assume what's around the next corner based on the last 10 corners. You can't assume what's around a corner based on the last time you went around it. Don't expect any road to be a Taylor Swift song with catchy melodies and a hook that makes you want to sing it in the shower. She wears short skirts, I wear t-shirts. I mean, it might be, but more likely it's going to be a Miles Davis jam session. It's conflict and it's compromised and it's just, it's new every time. It's brand new every night. It's very, very exciting. And if this explanation causes you to like jazz, yeah, I'm um, sorry. Tires are what connect you to the road. They are an expensive consumable, but equally critical. We've seen so many crashes that could have been avoided if riders would have taken better care of their tires or simply replaced them sooner. So what are the tire rules? First, buy a quality tire gauge and check your tire pressure regularly run your tire pressure according to the information listed in your owner's manual. And keep in mind that most manufacturers are going to give you cold pressures, meaning that you wanna check pressure before riding on the tire and generating heat. Second, replace them in pairs, or at the very least run matched sets. We go into a lot of detail about why this is important in our video specifically about tires. Third, get a quality tire gauge and check your tire pressure regularly. 
you should be able to tell someone your tire pressure with a less than 1% margin of error at any given moment. And finally, when in doubt, throw them out. So you're not sure if that newish tire will last that 10 day road trip, but to save some cash, you head out anyway. But the tire wears into the cords six days later, and now you lose an entire day or more of riding as you try to find a motorcycle shop in whatever rural town you happen to be in. Then you get to pay market price for a 12 year old super sport tire. Not only do you lose time riding and probably have to cut your planned route short, you paid out the nose for a tire that you'd never have chosen for your bike to begin with. Or what about the guy who thought he could get one more track day on a pretty tired set of race tires on his ultra low horsepower SV650? The rear tire slid out exiting a slow mellow corner and the end result was a high side. When he amateurized tires over how long they last, he was saving about 40 bucks to get one more day, and it cost him about $1,000 in damages, including needing a new helmet, not to mention all the bruises. Take care of your tires. They are your first defense against falling. You may be able to save a few bucks, but it may cost you a grand or even worse, an injury. If you live in America, even something as simple as a collarbone can cost you upwards of $20,000. Spending money on tires will end up saving you money in the long run. Look, it happens to all of us. A tire wears out faster than expected and we're caught out, but tires are a risky place to scrimp. As an added bonus, a little effort to manage tire pressure will extend the life of your tires, offering you better grip while saving you some money and extending the time between tire swaps. When it comes to cornering, we see two rider mistakes over and over again. The first, entering the turn too fast, which is why we go on and on and on about the value of trail braking and even have an entire video about it. But the second mistake we see repeatedly, entering a corner shallow or tipping in too soon. Sure, I get it. We're excited for the corner. We don't want to run wide. We like the whole leaning thing. And it's easy to get a little overly enthusiastic and start the turning as soon as possible. So why should we enter a corner from the outside? There's a couple of reasons. Cars lean the wrong way when they corner. They lean to the outside, putting more weight on their outside tires. This means that those outside tires are effectively scrubbing that outside path of travel, making it the cleanest part of the road. If the corner has less than ideal visibility, you can enhance how far you can see into and through the corner by entering from the outside path of travel. And finally, Motorcycles turn better and more efficiently when you delay your apex. What's an apex? In the context of motorcycling, the apex is where the motorcycle is closest to the inside of the corner. In most cases, you want to apex your corner about two thirds of the way through the turn. And the only way we can really do that is if we stay wide for as long as we can, or at least until we can see the exit of the corner and identify where the apex is. Only then do we want to move towards the inside of the corner, kiss our apex, and accelerate out of the turn. Oddly, because of how motorcycles like to turn, tipping in early or apexing early or running a tight line through a corner makes it far more likely that we will do the one thing we are trying to avoid, run wide in the later part of the turn. By being patient, staying wide and apexing later, not only are we less likely to run wide, but we're spending more time on the cleanest part of the road and we're in better shape to stay on the asphalt. Okay, so this one I kind of stole. I had a student who was a Vietnam era Cold War fighter pilot. I feel the need, the need for speed. And when I was coaching him about the importance of looking ahead, he was, oh yeah, stay ahead of the aircraft, got it. And as you expect, he went out and rode like a pro. Later I asked him, stay ahead of the aircraft, what did you mean by that? And he said, you have to think and plan for where the aircraft will be in 30, 60, or 90 seconds from now. Remember, he said, you are traveling at 700 to 1500 miles an hour. If you allow the aircraft to get ahead of you, where you are trying to mentally trying to catch up to the aircraft, that's when pilots crash. There's wisdom in that, right? 
So for us, stay ahead of the motorcycle. We need to be thinking and planning and making decisions on where we will be 30, 60, or 90 seconds from now. We may only be going 70 miles an hour, but we're also flying well below the hard deck. The hard deck for this hop was 10,000 feet. You knew it, you broke it. Many riders we've worked with who've participated in advanced rider training came in hoping for a magic bullet, that one secret that will suddenly launch their riding to the next level. But this is it. This is the secret sauce that you have to master if you want your riding to progress. And remember, it's not enough to just keep our chin up and our eyes up. We have to get our mind up and in front of the motorcycle. We need to be actively planning the next step every step of the way. And you can tell when you get better at this because everything slows down and the world becomes quiet, peaceful. Every move you make and every control input will be slow and precise. It'll go from being a rock concert in your head and become more like the music your mom listens to. On any Sunday like the tail of a kite Flying and dancing in the wind But a warning, you'll never master staying ahead of the motorcycle. Work on this skill more than any other we provided links to some great resources in the description, including two outstanding books, Sport Riding Techniques and Motorcycle Dynamics, which lays out all the physics and maths and uh, the hows and the whys motorcycles behave the way they do. If you'd like us to cover any one of these seven topics in greater detail, please comment below. Uh, and click like and subscribe and click on that little bell if you'd like to be notified whenever we upload a new video. Thank you so much for watching and ride well.